Number four, it is time for a question period. The Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Energy. Yesterday, the Premier said of the leaked Liberal Cabinet document, I quote, not the document on which our plan was built. Mr. Speaker, if this is the case, will the minister release the document that their plan was built on? The people deserve to know. Yes or no, will they do that? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, the plan was introduced in the uh, Assembly last Thursday, Mr. Speaker, and the uh, Leader of the Opposition has already come out and said that he's going to vote against uh, making sure that uh, you know, families and farms and small businesses in this province are going to get a 25 per cent reduction. He also said he's going to vote against giving rural and uh, northern families a 40 to 50 per cent reduction, Mr. Speaker. You know, when it comes to making sure that we're acting in the short term, our Fair Hydro plan is going to bring that relief for families, for small businesses and for farms once we can get this legislation passed, Mr. Speaker. It has been 76 days since they said that they would have some sort of idea on how to do something, Mr. Speaker. They've actually done nothing since that time. We've brought forward a plan that's going to work Answer. for every single family in this province, Mr. Speaker. We look forward to getting this bill passed through the House. Mr. Speaker, again to the Minister of Energy. My question was about the document, the Liberal Cabinet document, a graph that showed hydro rates are going to skyrocket in Ontario. We got an answer that was completely irrelevant to the question. So I'm going to ask again. We have the Premier saying the document was out of date, that the, their new plan was built on something else. This is a recent Liberal Cabinet document saying that their plan is going to skyrocket hydro rates. So I will give the Minister of Energy another chance. If this was not recent, if this was not the plan, they're the, the clock, please. Start the clock. I'm trying to ask the other side to stop. Please. This document was not the one they built their plan on, like the Liberal cabinet document says. Will the minister release the graph that will show this is not the case? The people deserve Question. to know. Yes or no, will you release the document? The minister, minister of Indigenous uh, uh, Reconciliation uh, come to order, and the member from Etobicoke North come to order. Mr. Speaker, the 2013 long term member energy Niagara's plan South outlines Lambert where um, our government, with uh, consultation with stakeholders and energy experts, showed where we believed prices were going to go. But what we've done, Mr. Speaker, is we've pulled costs out of the system. The $3.5 billion re renegotiation of the Samsung agreement, the cancellation of LRP2, Mr. Speaker, both took significant billions of dollars out of the system. So, Mr. Speaker, when you look at what the 2013 long-term energy plan said where we were going to be, we've actually reduced that number significantly. This plan that we have brought forward, Mr. Speaker, and are hoping to get passed through this House, we want to see that passed because we're going to bring 25 per cent, on average, a reduction on every single electricity bill for families, small businesses and farms, Mr. Speaker. 76 days. They've done nothing. It just shows, Thank Mr. You. Speaker, they have no plan for the. Thank you. Final supplementary. Mr. Speaker, again to the Minister of Energy. The Minister of Energy quoted a 2013 long term energy plan. I'm talking about a Liberal cabinet document for 2017. Let's talk about what you're talking about right now. And right now, the Liberal cabinet have a graph that shows hydro rates are going to skyrocket and skyrocket and go through the roof. And I know they're, they're doing damage control right now because a whistleblower from this government exposed this government that once again, every time they touch hydro, they make it worse. Now, a third time to the Minister of Energy, if the Liberal cabinet graph is wrong, if hydro rates are not going to skyrocket, will you do Will you at least be fair to the people of Ontario and provide us the new graph, the new document that your plan is based on? Will we have that disclosure, yes or no? You see that, please? You see that, please? Thank you.
Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Of course. Just like we did with the 2010 long-term energy plan and the 2013 long-term energy plan, we'll be bringing forward the 2017 long-term energy plan, Mr. Speaker. That will show where we were going to project where prices are going to be. And you know where they're going to be right now, Mr. Speaker? 25 percent lower than where they were last year. And that's thanks to this government, Mr. Speaker, bringing forward a plan that's going to make sure that we help every single family, farm and small business in this province. Where's their plan, Mr. Speaker? The last I heard is they were joking that it was in policy development, but now we know, Mr. Speaker, that they're going to conjure something up on that magic weekend in November. But what we're doing, Mr. Speaker, is we're making sure 40 to 50 percent is coming off for 800,000 families as we make sure that we're helping those in rural or remote parts of our province, yes, and 25 percent coming off for every family, 500,000 small businesses and farms, Mr. Yes, Speaker. New question. Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Energy. Based on the Liberal Cabinet document leak that shows hydro rates are going to skyrocket, I want to ask a very direct question to the Minister of Energy. What will hydro rates be in Ontario in 2022? The document says they're going to skyrocket. Please correct the record. Tell us what hydro rates will be. What type of increase are we going to see in 2022? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Once again, we've been talking about what we're going to do in the short term, which is bring about 25 percent reduction. Oh, I know, Mr. Speaker. When it comes to the medium term, Finish, please. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. In the medium term, for the next four years, we're holding our, uh, our cost and rates of increases, Mr. Speaker, to the rate of inflation. And then in the long term, the 2017 long term energy plan, that will actually dictate where Remember prices are going to be. Projected. But by 2022, Mr. Speaker, I'm hoping that we Answer. might even see something from them that relates to a plan because I think it'll take them that long, Mr. Thank Speaker. Supplementary. Speaker, again to the Minister of Energy, and he had a very re revealing remark there. He said we're only focused on the short exactly, term. Exactly. Surprise, surprise, Mr. Exactly. Speaker. What's happening next year? It's an election. And that's what cost Ontarians every time. They come up with gimmicks, they come up with games exactly. to create a house of cards, and Ontario ends up paying more. Minister of Remember when we had the gas plant? Every time they're concerned about elections and not the long-term cost for Ontario, Ontarians pay more. So, Mr. Speaker, according to this Liberal document, this Liberal Cabinet document, by 2024, Member electricity prices will reach a, a record high in Ontario. So, my question to the Minister of Energy, this document says we will reach a record high in 2024. Is that correct? 2024, your document, Question. this government's document, says it will be a record high. Please tell us otherwise. Thank you. Minister. That's incorrect, Mr. Speaker. The 2017 long-term energy plan is still being worked on, Mr. Speaker, and we're still making sure that we're going to pull costs out of the system. And I know they have a hard time understanding anything about the electricity, Mr. Speaker, because they don't even have a plan. They first started talking about a five-point plan, then a three-point plan. Member from here on, Bruce. This, please. And then a zero-point plan, Mr. Speaker. And I know the people of Ontario can't wait for a magic weekend in November. That's why we're bringing forward legislation, if passed, will reduce rates by 25 percent. That will help families, small businesses, and farms. We got an OESP program enhancement, Mr. Answer. Speaker. We've got a First Nation on reserve re uh, reduction, Mr. Speaker. These are things that are helping families. Thank you. There's got nothing in their plan, Mr. Speaker. They don't even. Have Thank you. 
Final supplementary. Mr. Speaker, again to the Minister of Energy. You know, this, this Liberal cabinet document that shows hydro rates are going to skyrocket is so disappointing. I think many Ontarians hope that when the Liberals said they're finally going to address their own hydro mess, that maybe we would have seen executive salaries be reined in. Maybe we would have seen the government say we were wrong to collect $1.3 million in donations from the 30 mega renewable contracts. That was bad policy. Maybe they would have apologized to Ontarians. Instead, right now, we've got an election gimmick. As the Minister of Energy said himself, this is about the short term. I'm concerned about the long term. I'm concerned that our hydro rates are going to continue to skyrocket, and their own document says that. Actually, 2022 it goes up, 2024 it goes up. In your own document in 2028, it's going to jump 10 wow. percent. Mr. Speaker, Question? our families can't afford this. When were we actually going to address the structural problems in hydro? When will this government actually clean Thank up you. their own mess? You see it, please? You see it, please? Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, structural changes are being done right now by our system operator with market renewal, market reform, and a capacity auction, Mr. Speaker. We're already two steps ahead of this party on many things, Mr. Speaker. When it comes to the electricity file, we've even got a plan bringing forward serious reductions for all families. You know what, Mr. Speaker? A 25 percent reduction in the short term and in the medium term is something that families in this province want and need, and we're delivering, Mr. Speaker, a 40 to 50 percent reduction for families that live in the rural and northern parts of our province. That is something they need in the short term and in the medium term, and we're delivering, Mr. Speaker. And when it comes to the long term, Mr. Speaker, the only thing that is going long term right now is we're 76 days without them putting one iota, one idea on the table about what to do. We've got a long term plan coming, and the 2017 long term energy plan will continue to address and pull costs out of the system. Thank you. New question, the Leader of the Third Party. Speaker. Speaker, my question is for the Acting Premier. The Premier is uh, trying to sell the public a bill of goods here. Leaked documents show that she knows that her hydro plan will end up costing, or causing hydro rates to soar. Speaker. But in a few months that she's been bragging about this plan, she's never mentioned that fact, not a once. Why is the Premier trying to hide the real cost of her hydro plan? Speaker. You know, Speaker, um, we really want an Ontario where everybody has an even chance, where there's a level playing field. And we know, Speaker, that when you're worried about your hydro bill, you're not able to focus on those other things, Speaker, that will make your life better. So that's why we are reducing electricity prices by 25 per cent, Speaker. We have a plan. It's an important plan. It will provide relief for people. We are still waiting. Oh. Premier. Deputy Premier. Uh, Speaker, we, we have had, um, we have had a, a plan, if you want to call it that, from the NDP, and I'm happy to see that they're actually starting to execute that plan because one piece of that plan, Speaker, was to get the federal government to uh, pay Answer. for uh, hydro prices, and now we're one step closer to having the member from Bramley Gore Moulton, elected uh, leader, you. elected prime minister, and then. Thank you. Well, I'm glad the uh, deputy leader over there is uh, prepared to vote for Jagmeet Singh for the leadership of the uh, Canadian NDP. Who knew that she was a closet New Democrat speaker? She certainly doesn't act like one. Look, we know that this document was leaked last week, Speaker. It's a document that this government continues to claim is a document that's out of date. In fact, the Premier uses that language, the Minister uses that language, but I have to say that sounds more like and I quote, the gas plants will only cost $40 million, yeah. or I promise we won't sell Hydro One, oh. or nobody tried to bribe anybody in the Sudbury by-election. Oh. That's how the Premier and her Liberal Party govern. They move from one scandal to the next speaker. Will this Premier stop the cycle of scandals and just come clean with the people of Ontario about the real cost of her borrowing scheme Question. that the people cannot afford. 
Mr. Mr. Speaker, I'm very pleased to rise and talk about our Fair Hydro plan and, of course, Mr. Speaker, the plan that is actually going to bring forward a 25 per cent reduction to help all families, all small businesses, 500,000 of those small businesses and farms across the province, Mr. Speaker. And that's why we've acted, to make sure that we have this legislation to get through this House, because if it passes, we're also going to help 800,000. 800,000 families in rural and northern parts of our province, Mr. Speaker. And I know the NDP and the PCs have already said that they're going to vote against this, Mr. Speaker. They're going to vote against giving families relief now, relief in the midterm, Mr. Speaker, and relief in the long term. Mr. Speaker, our plan is making sure that we build Ontario up, make sure that we create jobs build the infrastructure we need, and at the same time, find ways of reducing rates for all people right across this province. Thank you. Final supplementary. Speaker, the bottom line is that the people of Ontario deserve the facts. They deserve the facts. The Premier needs to tell families and businesses what the real cost of this borrowing scheme will be, and they deserve to know how much Premier Wynne intends to increase the hydro bills, and they deserve to know now. They deserve to know now, Speaker, before the next election. That's when people need the information. So will this Premier and this Minister do the right thing and tell Ontario families, families and businesses, tell everyone that's sitting in this chamber right now what the real cost of their plan is going to be? Thank you. Minister. Thank you. You see it, please? You see it, please? The member from Hamilton East Stony Creek will withdraw. Bubble talk? Withdraw. Thank you. Carry on. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So let's talk about facts. 25% reduction for all families, 500,000 small businesses and farms in this province. Another fact, Mr. Speaker, 800,000 families in rural or northern parts of our province will see a 40 to 50 percent reduction, Mr. Speaker, once we can get this legislation passed. The Ontario Electricity Support Program, fact, Mr. Speaker, increased by an additional 50 percent. New line items, including more people to qualify for that. Fact, Mr. Speaker, 192,000 families are currently on the OESP program. Another fact, Mr. Speaker, is that we've reduced the, uh, the delivery line for First Nations, on reserve First Nations. That's an $85 savings, Mr. Speaker, for those families. That's a fact that we're making a difference in their lives. Another fact, Mr. Speaker, is both the NDP and the PCs have said they are voting against this, Mr. Answer. Speaker. The other fact is that's going to hurt every family in this province. Thank you. New question, the leader of the third party. Thank you, Speaker. My next question is uh, also for the Acting Premier. Last week, I was in Sault Ste. Marie, where I met Steve and Lucy Franzi. Steve and Lucy are business owners, Speaker. They have a number of country-style donut and M&M meats shops. At each store, their monthly hydro bills are now topping $2,000. They spend over $10,000 a month just on their hydro bills. They've done everything that they can do to reduce costs. They've changed all the lighting, they did extra work on their freezers to make them more energy efficient, but nothing is bringing their bills down. How can the Premier implement a hydro plan that will end up costing this hardworking family even more in a couple years' time? Thank you, Dr. Minister of Energy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As we've said, the Fair Hydro Plan applies to small businesses. Many of these small businesses that the uh, leader of the third party has mentioned will qualify for the uh, Fair Hydro Plan and that 25 percent reduction. So these, these businesses and these family-run businesses will see that 25 percent reduction if passed, Mr. Speaker, Good. and that is making sure that we are helping these small businesses keep more money in their pockets so they can continue to expand and grow, just like we've been seeing. Uh, other businesses like Outspoken do that in Sault Ste. Marie, Mr. Speaker. We're going to continue to find ways to help our small businesses in this province, and when it comes to electricity concerns, we've even addressed those that don't qualify for the 25 per cent reduction. We changed the ICI program once again, Mr. Speaker. This will actually reduce the rate uh, of qualification to ensure that thousands yes, more sir. businesses will qualify again, Mr. Speaker, saving businesses in this province thousands of dollars on their electricity bills. 
Speaker, the Fronzies employ over 50 people in the Sioux. They pride themselves on being able to offer good jobs to Sioux residents. But with their exorbitant hydro bills, they're worried that they're going to have to cut back on staff. Why is this Premier? Why is this Liberal government forcing good, community-minded employers like Steve and Lucy to choose between providing jobs in Sault Ste. Marie and paying hydro bills? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Once again, as I said, these type of businesses will qualify for the 25 percent reduction, Mr. Speaker. So that's good news for the 500,000 small businesses that actually qualify for this, uh, for this program. Uh, we're also working with the Ontario Chamber of Commerce to make sure that we can get all of the programs that are out to help many of these businesses lower their consumption. When they lower their consumption, Mr. Speaker, they also lower their bills. The ICI program that I know many of the businesses in the Sioux are actually seeing, Mr. Speaker, this will actually help them lower their bills by up to a third. And for those that weren't qualifying before, Mr. Speaker, for this program, we lowered the threshold from one megawatt to 500 kilowatts or 0.5 megawatts, Mr. Speaker. That opens up this program for thousands of businesses right across the province. We're going to continue yes, to work with the Chamber of Commerce. We're going to continue to work with small businesses Mostly. to make sure that they can continue to grow and Thank make you. Ontario prosper. Final supplementary. Steve and Lucy are not alone. All over Ontario, businesses that were promised relief are now reeling from the truth that the Liberal Hydro Plan is borrowing a borrowing scheme that is designed to make Liberal friends rich at the expense of hardworking Ontario families. Why is this peer Premier punishing? punishing Ontario families, families and businesses with this wrong-headed hydro scheme. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The only two parties that are punishing Ontario's are the opposition parties, Mr. Speaker, by voting against this bill. How can they say, Mr. Speaker, how can they say that a 25 percent reduction today is punishing? It is actually helping families, small businesses and farms right across our province, not only this year, Mr. Speaker, not only next year, and not only the following year, but the year after that, Mr. Speaker. And then the 2017 long-term energy plan will kick in, and you know what, Mr. Speaker? We're going to continue to take costs out of the system that will see rates even drop more, Mr. Speaker. We found ways to make sure that we can help Ontario families. We're going to continue to do that. They can talk about magic weekends in November and coming up with policy or ideas that pie in the sky, Mr. Speaker, that don't do anything and don't even take a single cent. Neither party has talked about how they can take a single cent off any bills. We're taking 25 percent, Mr. Speaker, and we're proud of that. Thank you. Your question, the member from Perth, Wellington. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. Late last Friday, Toronto police were forced to shoot and kill a bear that had wandered onto city streets. Police spokesman Mark Pugash said that they called the Ministry of Natural Resources, but no one was able to come and help us. They were told that there were not any resources to assist them. Mr. Speaker, why was no one from Natural Resources able to help and trap the bear? Minister. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you very much to the member for the question. Public safety is the most important thing in cases like these. Local police made the decision based on the situation unfolding in front of them. My ministry was contacted that night by police, and they provided some advice. They were unable to, for public safety reasons, Finish, please. Thank you. It is not safe to attempt to tranquilize a bear at night. The Toronto police made the decision. They were the ones on the ground making the decision. They reached out to my ministry for advice. So they provided the information. I agree it's Answer. an unfortunate situation, but these are wild animals. The police and my ministry have a duty to ensure that the public is protected. Thank you. Supplementary. Back to the minister, Mr. Speaker. You know, Don Cherry had this to say. I don't blame the police.
Feel free to continue disrespecting the chair. Minister of Aboriginal Affairs, come to order. Second time. I don't blame the police because they didn't have the equipment or backup. It's a dark day, and we have to learn from this. But, Mr. Speaker, the government refuses to learn because these dark days aren't all that rare in Ontario. June the 2nd, 2015, after a bear was shot in, in Newmarket, the former minister said that nuisance bears were not the responsibilities of the MNR. And the reason the police had to act was the MNR couldn't work weekends. This time, MNR said they couldn't work at night. It sounds like the minister doesn't seem to give her staff the resources at all. Mr. Speaker, when will this government take responsibility? These Question. bear deaths are a direct result of their cuts. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. We have a protocol that we follow in Ontario when working with local police in these situations. We would never second-guess law enforcement's decision regarding public safety. And I want to give a shout-out to our officers across Ontario that protect the public, both police and the conservation officers of MNR. We were on the phone that night to provide advice. Our ministry officials will go out in the daylight hours to tranquilize a bear. Let me reiterate, it is not safe to try and tranquilize a bear at night. We would also like to take a moment to reiterate that if you see a bear that poses a threat to public safety, you need to call 911 and your local police. My ministry is always available for advice and support when need be, but I would never second guess a police decision to make sure that public safety is the most important thing and that they provided public Thank safety you. that night. Your question, the member from Toronto Danforth. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question to the Acting Premier. The Premier promised before the last election to lower auto insurance rates for Ontario drivers by 15 per cent. After the election, she said it wasn't actually a promise, it was a stretch goal. We know the Premier's hydro borrowing scheme is the same as her auto insurance promise, a political calculation designed to confuse Ontario voters into voting for her party in the next election. Will the government finally admit that this is the case? Minister Finance. Mr. Finance. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, thank you for the question from the member opposite. Usually, something that the deputy uh, leader of the opposition third party would ask, and I recognize that he's not available now. But hopefully, uh, in time, he'll be able to also act and provide some assistance as we move forward, Mr. Speaker, as we are with David Marshall's report to ensure we curb the uh, the increasing costs within the system to enable us to reduce premiums. And they have been reduced over time, around eight to nine percent now, Mr. Speaker. And we're further doing more in order to achieve. Uh, our goal, Mr. Speaker, and that's an ongoing uh, uh, situation. Stop the clock. And I'm sure the member, of, uh, Minister of Finance, along with all members, know that we do not make reference to someone's uh, attendance in this place. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Again, to the acting premier. I hope this time they'll listen to the question. The premier needs to figure out another way to get votes. She needs to understand that toying with people's lives for political advantage is not acceptable, and it doesn't work. Ontarians need Chief real relief from skyrocketing hydro prices that the Premier has helped create. When will she offer the people of Ontario a solution that benefits them, not the Liberal Party? Sure. So, Mr. Speaker, the member opposite knows that a report has been issued. David Marshall has gone forward with a number of important recommendations. It's up for public debate, part of which would reduce the cost of the system. And I hope the member opposite will take it into account as he proceeds forward to initiate some of this to reduce those costs, to then enable us to have further reductions in our premiums. And, Mr. Speaker, it's an ongoing thing that we've always been said we would do, and we are doing it. And there are about 20 odd companies that have now reduced the rates by more than 15 percent. It's a competitive industry, and we'll continue moving forward and working with the industry to achieve our goals. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. New question, the member from Davenport. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Citizenship and Immigration. Uh, 
Minister, our government and the not-for-profit sector share, some, share the common goal of healthy and vibrant Ontario communities. In my riding of Davenport, a significant number of constituents rely on local not-for-profit organizations like South Asian Women's Centre that increase self-awareness of women and to empower women to develop their social and cultural potential. Minister, it is crucial to my constituents that they can access organizations that assist to develop their full, full potential by increasing their economic, social and political standing in society. Mr. Speaker, can the minister share what the government is doing to strengthen the not-for-profit sector so that Ontarians can continue to access the support they need to succeed? Thank you, Minister. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the dedicated member from uh, Davenport for advocating for immigrant women and the not-for-profit sector in her community. Here, here. Mr. Speaker, Ontario is home to more than 55,000 registered not-for-profits. Not only do, to, do they contribute to every aspect of our society, but they also positively impact our economy. The not-for-profit sector contributes close to $67 billion to Ontario's economy. Wow. Mr. Speaker, our ministry supports non-profits through our partnership grant program. Since 2011, we have invested almost $18 million to help 67 organizations build program evaluation, inclusive leadership, and volunteer management capacity. Answer. Thank you. Minister, uh, supplementary. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the minister for her response, and it is reassuring to see that our government is committed to strengthening ties with the not-for-profit sector so that Ontarians can access the resources they need. I'm sure the minister would agree that the work of local not-for-profit organizations is critical to the success of constituents. Minister, it is important that we continue to support the not-for-profit sector to build capacity by investing in projects that support intra-sector cooperation, communication and networks. I understand that the minister earlier this year was joined by the member from Newmarket Aurora at the Blue Hills Child and Family Centre to make a funding announcement. Speaker, can the minister tell us how our government is enhancing support for not-for-profit organizations so that they can continue to assist Ontarians. Minister of Citizenship and Immigration. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. The member from Davenport recalls well. Earlier this year, I was joined by the member from Newmarket Aurora to announce an investment of over $4 million over two years for 21 grants across the wow. province to support and strengthen organizations so that they can continue to serve the people of Ontario. Mr. Speaker, this program is essential to building capacity within the not-for-profit sector. The projects being funded will reach over two thousand 1,800 organizations, which in turn will assist thousands of Ontarians. The member from Devonport will be pleased to learn that the South Asian Women's Centre in a writing will be receiving up to $129,000 to develop a diversity wow. and inclusion leadership strategy and provide essential training to partner Answer. agency. Mr. Speaker, our ministry recognizes that nonprofit organizations play a crucial role in maintaining the well-being of our society. Bravo. New question, the member from Huron, Bruce. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Indigenous Relations and Reconciliation. On Saturday, May 6, 17-year-old Tammy Kiash failed to make curfew at her Thunder Bay group home. Tragically, her body was discovered in the Neving McIntyre floodway. Between Saturday and Sunday, no one in her family or the North Caribou First Nation community or the Nishinaabe Aski Nation was notified that she had not returned home. Nobody, Speaker, was looking out for this young woman. Sadly, in total, four Indigenous youth living in group homes have died in the last six months. Why, Speaker, is the minister sitting idly by and letting this happen under his watch? Minister of Indigenous Relations and Reconciliation. Well, thank you for that question. Uh, we take these issues very seriously. I can tell you that yesterday afternoon, the Minister of Children and Youth Services and I spent the afternoon at the Native Centre on Spadina Road from about 1 o'clock to 5 o'clock, in which we discussed the issues around, specifically surrounding First Nation children and the issues they have in care, being taken into care, how they're dealt with in care. At that meeting was, as I said, uh, Minister uh, of Children and Youth Services, myself, 
and the leadership from First Nations communities across Ontario. They shared with us their, their very frank and their very poignant stories. But more than their frank and poignant stories, they threw solutions out. Uh, they placed solutions Answer. on the table about how to deal with these, and I'd be happy to deal with that in the supplementary. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I appreciate that update. But we have to remember, June 28 marks the one-year anniversary since the Thunder Bay inquiry resulted in 145 recommendations on how to better support Indigenous youth in care. One recommendation dealt with the development of policies dealing with missing students, specifically the timely filing of missing person reports. A year later, though, Speaker, Indigenous youth are still dying and their families and communities have no safeguard. Speaker, today we've seen more calls for action. So I ask the minister, will you support the call from the Ontario Children's Aid Society and NAND leadership and call a coroner's inquest into these recent deaths? Thank you. Minister of Children and Youth Services. Children and Youth Services. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I want to thank the member uh, for the question because um, uh, this is a, a really important issue, um, and um, like the minister uh, who was responsible for uh, Indigenous Affairs and Reconciliation uh, said yesterday, we had a, a very, um, uh, a very uh, meaningful conversation with the leadership, with chiefs right across the, uh, the province um, uh, here in Toronto. And uh, in addition to that, Mr. Speaker, I've been to uh, many uh, different jurisdictions across this province and spoken to young people and to, uh, to leaders and elders within communities. And um, we, have, um, we have a plan uh, moving forward when it comes to group homes and uh, children in care, a new blueprint that we will be bringing forward uh, very shortly uh, with some substantial changes. But, uh, Mr. Speaker, the most important piece here is returning Answer. jurisdiction back to Indigenous communities and making sure that those communities can care for their children. And that's the direction that Thank we're you. moving in. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. New question, a member from Nickelbelt. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Acting Premier. Yesterday, I participated in the Ontario Roundtable organized by Diabetes Canada. Their number one issue was access to medication and supplies. Diabetes is an expensive disease to manage, and high out-of-pocket costs compromise people's ability to access the medication they need. Charlene is 60 years old. She buys her insulin in vials, mixes them herself before she injects with a needle in order to save money. She told us that the essential medicine that she needs, including her insulin, is costing us $1,000 a month, and with no public drug coverage, that money comes straight out of her pocket. Like millions of people in Ontario, the 1.5 million diabetic patient needs universal Question. pharma care that covers everyone, no matter how old you are. Why doesn't the Premier do that? Health, long-term care. Well, Mr. Speaker, since uh, we developed a, a provincial Ontario's diabetes strategy uh, roughly a decade ago, we've made important changes so that all Ontarians with diabetes will have access to the necessities that they need. And, and out of that 1.5 million individuals that the uh, member opposite referenced, uh, my sister, uh, who uh, for almost 50 years, in fact, she was diagnosed in her teens as insulin dependent. So this is an issue that I know extremely well, despite the heckling, actually, that I'm receiving from the leader of the third party. Uh, and Mr. Speaker, um, and that, that includes, that, in, that includes, well, my, my sister who is that age and has had diabetes Chair, since 16, Mr. Speaker. So we provide for children and adults uh, uh, insulin pumps, Mr. Speaker. We provide for diabetic test and strips. Sir. We provide for those who are of limited means as well on Ontario Works or ODSB additional support so that they can manage their diabetes effectively. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Well, with universal pharmacare, every Ontarian would have drug coverage no matter how old they are. <laughs> universal pharmacare would save the life of 830 diabetic patients each and every year in Ontario. Ontarians should never be forced to skip their medication. They should never have to go into credit card debt just to fill their prescription. And people Minister like of Health. Charlene 
shouldn't have to worry about whether she can afford the essential medication she needs to manage her diabetes. Universal Pharmacare is for everyone. It is the right thing to do, so why won't the Liberal government do it? Thank you. Minister? Well, Mr. Speaker, I would implore the third party to stop describing their program as universal pharmacare because it's anything but. What, so what would, what, would the, what would that member, Mr. Speaker, say to the— Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And in the, uh, the over 4,000 days that the leader of the third party has been in this legislature, she, prior to a couple of weeks ago, she mentioned the word pharmacare three times. Oh. One reference was in reference to an, an op-ed. Wrap up, please. And there was more than 4,000 times. One was in reference to an op-ed that I wrote on pharmacare, and the second was in reference to the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which was likely an erroneous Thank reference. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, our pharmacare begins January. Thank you. New question, member from Scarborough, Agent Court. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Children and Youth Services. Minister, this past weekend marked a Youth in Care Day across Ontario. May 14 every year is a time for all of us to recognize these young people's contribution to the province, as well as the strength, bravery, and resilience. These young people have have our government's full support, and I know the minister has a long history of advocating for children and youth in this province to help position them for success and also help them to thrive. As my neighbour, uh, Speaker, the minister is quite familiar with my riding of Scarborough Agent Court and have met with many children and youth to hear about their concerns on safety, access and child welfare issues. Speaker, through you to the minister, can he please provide some insight on how the government is helping young people and, and children and youth in care? Very nice. Thank you, Minister Children and Youth well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the, uh, the member from uh, Scarborough Agent Court uh, for this uh, question, but I also want to uh, I want to thank her for her advocacy on this issue. In fact, it was her private member's bill uh, that established this day uh, to be recognized here in Ontario. So thank you so much for all the work you've done. Um, as the minister responsible for children and youth services here in the province of Ontario, um, it is an absolute privilege for me to get out uh, across the province and meet uh, young people. And um, there are so many young people uh, that I've met who are in care um, with lived experiences that are, uh, are working towards building a better Ontario for the next generation of young people uh, who live uh, in care. So, Mr. Speaker, we're currently working on a very comprehensive piece of legislation, which members of the House know uh, about, to reform the uh, child welfare sector yes, here in this province. So every single young person has the opportunity in this province to reach their full potential. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. And thank you to the Minister. Um, I'm very pleased, Minister, to see that on Bill 89, many young people have added their voice before going through the legislative process of this House. We just finished committee stage and is now coming back to the House for third reading. Our government knows how important this legislation is, and we want to get this right, Mr. Speaker. I also know the Minister has listened closely to the feedback yes. from those who appear before the Standing Committee, especially young people, sharing their experience both at the public hearings and throughout the 
consultation process. Our government's amendment to the bill's feedback also reflects some of the amendments in the, in the bill. That's Minister, great. can you please share with the House how Bill 89, as amended, would impact youth in care should the bill be passed? Thank you, Minister. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And um, uh, the member uh, is correct that we had a, uh, the opportunity to get out there and engage with a lot of young people, uh, and they provided uh, a tremendous amount of insight into the changes that they thought were necessary uh, at the beginning stage through the consultation over the last few years to, uh, uh, to build the initial legislation, but also through the committee amendment process. So um, this bill, uh, Mr. Speaker, is such an important piece of legislation. Uh, one of the pieces that I think is so important is that it raises the age of protection uh, and uh, will now protect 16 and 17 year olds who may be vulnerable and need support. Uh, in addition to that, um, it'll improve oversight for service providers, including children's aid societies, so that children and youth uh, receive consistent, high-quality services right across this province. And it'll affirm the rights of children and require service Answer. providers to uphold them. And Mr. Speaker, Speaker, most importantly, it upholds Caitlin's principles, clearly, clearly stating that every child Thank has you. the right to be heard and respected. Thank you. Your question, the member from Holland and Norfolk. The Minister of uh, Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs, we've now seen 10 months of turmoil in Ontario's processing vegetable market. It's incumbent on government to work through a process consistent with the needs of both growers and processors while supporting regulated marketing and supporting the growth of Ontario's processing vegetable industry. The 2017 crop negotiations are wrapped up. There's more work to do. When will we see your government's promised economic impact study? It's been 10 months now. And when will we see the establishment of the Industry Advisory Committee? Thank you. Minister of Food, Agriculture and Rural Affairs. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the member from Hall of Norfolk for a very a thoughtful question this morning. Uh, we, of course, had issued uh, Regulation uh, 440, a process uh, that we're working through. Uh, we had a particular challenge uh, this early spring. Uh, with the uh, tomato crop in the province of Ontario. Uh, we appointed one of the most distinguished people in the province of Ontario, the former agriculture minister, the Honourable Albert Buchanan, uh, who served uh, so well in this House from 1990 to 95 uh, to act as a trustee. And now, Mr. Speaker, there is a court case that is potentially pending, and because that court case is potentially pending, I can't comment any further. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, look, the, uh processing vegetable industry, they've invested thousands of dollars in land and labor and plant and equipment, machinery and information. You mentioned Regulation 440. The growers, the processors, they've now negotiated a minimum price and terms and conditions of agreement for the coming season. However, planting, irrigating, harvest is looming with the attendant need for oversight of grading, filling contracts, uh, adjusting contracts, ever mindful of the vagaries of weather and other externalities. Minister, growers need their elected and trusted organization back to ensure orderly marketing. Right. <laughs> they need the representation, directors, committees, support staff. When will we see the election of directors? And when will we see the appointment Questions. of staff to make the required decisions during harvest? Mr. Speaker, I want, to thank, I want to thank the member for a supplementary question. Uh, we were faced with a situation that we wanted to make sure that we protected a crop in 2017. We wanted to protect family farms, and we wanted to protect the processing industry, which is so important to agriculture in the province of Ontario. We appointed, as I said, one of the most distinguished people in agricultural province of Ontario today, the Honourable Albert Buchanan. He acted as a trustee. He was able to negotiate contracts to make sure uh, that we got those crops planted in the ground and potentially harvest for a robust uh, sector of that part of Ontario's agriculture. I take the member's representation this morning, but there is a, a pending court case, and I can't comment any further, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. New question, the member from Kitchener, Waterloo. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the acting uh, premier. One out of every 10 workers in the province of Ontario make the minimum wage, which has not kept pace with the rising cost of almost everything. 70% of Ontarians want to see a $15 minimum wage, yet there was nothing in the budget. And the minister has made it clear there's nothing in the changing workplaces report. 
New Democrats listened, Speaker. That's why we have committed to increasing the minimum wage to $15 an hour for over a year now. Will the acting premier commit today to raise the minimum wage to $15 an hour for the workers in this province? Thank you. Minister, 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 Labor. Minister of Labour. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member for this question. There obviously is discussion right throughout the North American continent on minimum wages these days. What we've done as a government, Speaker, we want to make sure that every family in this province is able to benefit from the economy of this problem, Speaker. The economy is robust. We're leading in economic growth amongst the G7. Speaker, Ontario is doing well. We need to ensure that every sector, every person, from the uh, high-income earners to low-income earners are earning their share in that economy, Speaker. That's why we implemented the Change in Workplaces Review, to make sure that we took a look at all the labor relations aspects, all the employment standards, Speaker, that, uh, that have been raised by organized labor, by business, by poverty advocates throughout the province of Ontario. I hope to uh, come back to the House after the report is released once the public has seen the report and is able to digest it, Speaker, with some changes that I think really meet the needs of those hard-working Ontarian Speaker that have relied on a sense of decency in Ontario's workplaces. Thank you. Supplementary. So for over a year now, New Democrats have been committed to the $15 minimum wage. Again, last week, we asked this Liberal government, will you commit? to this wage. And we asked again on April 25th, then we asked again on March 8th, and we asked again on February 23rd. And any time this Liberal government has been asked if they'll raise the minimum wage, Chief the minister's Webb, answer time. has been the same. And I quote, Ontarians want predictable. No, they don't, Speaker. They want change. And and hardworking Ontarians deserve a $15 minimum wage. Will this be another stretch goal, or will this government commit today to raise the minimum wage to $15 an hour? Minister. Speaker, I want to thank the member again for that question. Obviously, I say, as I said at the uh, start of the previous answer, Speaker, this is a topic that is being discussed all over North America. When you look to, the, uh, to our neighbours to the south, you're seeing changes implemented on a city basis, on a state basis, when you look to uh, our own country, you're seeing changes that are being made on a provincial basis. Speaker, It's about protecting people's wages. It's about protecting their ability to earn a good living. Speaker. Now, Speaker, we've gone through a review that has looked at employment standards. We've looked at labour relations in the province of Ontario to make sure that we fully understand the ramifications of what we do. What the Premier asked me to do in the mandate letter was to take a look at the, uh, the workplaces today, make sure that the legislation is up to date, and do it in a way that Ontario and business sir. can remain in can re remain competitive, Speaker. The NDP has referred to this as a waste of time. I could not agree more, Speaker. It's very important. Thank you. Your question, the member from Beaches is short. Well, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the minister responsible for early years and child care. Minister, I am proud of our government is committed to ensuring that families have access to quality and affordable child care all across the province. But I hear over and over again from my constituents about the struggle to find child care for their children. There is an acute shortage, and while we have addressed the issue of non-refundable waitlist fees that I raised in a private member's bill, more supply of affordable spaces is required. And as the MPP for Beaches East York, I want to ensure that we are providing child care options for all of the families in need across the province. So, Speaker, will the minister responsible for early years and child care please tell us all what the government is doing to make sure families' needs are going to be met? Thank you. Minister of Status of Women responsible for early years and child care. I would ask that those kinds of things not be said, please. Really need a response. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thanks to the hardworking member from Beaches East York for this important question. Hard work. Speaker, it's vital for families to have access to quality, affordable childcare, and we know that this is, can be a challenge for families. That's why I'm proud that our government has a plan to modernize the way we are delivering childcare. The 2017 budget reaffirmed our government's commitment to help 100,000 more children access affordable, quality, licensed. 
childcare. Wow. And we're starting immediately with an investment of $200 million for the 2017-18 year. This funding supports the creation of 24,000 more spaces for children. It will provide immediate relief for families, reduce wait lists, encourage reduced fees, and increase subsidies. This investment Answer. will be felt by thousands of parents searching for affordable, accessible childcare. Wow, good work. I'm waiting for the, oh there it is. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you, and thank you to the Minister for her excellent work in trying to provide more daycare spaces for our constituents right across the province. It's encouraging to know that our government is working to address the needs of Ontario families. And I know that I'm working very hard with local daycare providers like Debbie Viscotti, the executive director of Centre 55, to identify new locations in Beaches East York for affordable daycare in Beaches East York. And I know that families in my riding are excited to see that new nonprofit daycare space spaces are being created. And I recognize there's a lot more work to be done, and people who are involved in the child care and early years sector are keen to see how the system will be modernized. We've heard about the 100,000 new spaces being created, and our government with swift action will help provide families with access to child care that they need right now. But, Speaker, will the minister please explain to us and tell us more about the way in which our government is plans to transform child care in the long term? Good, minister. Mr. Speaker, I'm pleased to answer the member's question. My ministry and I have been working hard to support the needs of families when it comes to early years and childcare in Ontario. We know that providing space is not enough, which is why we are developing a renewed early years and childcare framework to help transform the entire system. Speaker, we want to help families get the support they need, whether they choose to stay at home with a young one or use childcare. And this framework will include an affordability strategy to create long-term solutions. As you know, we held consultations in 20 different Ontario communities and heard from close to 8,000 people. The needs of families in this province are diverse, and I'm pleased to say that we will be sharing the details of our framework in the coming weeks. The 2017 budget Answer. commitment is just the start. Thank you. New question? The member from Chatham, Kent, Essex. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of natural resources and forestry. Speaker, it's been over five years and four MNRF ministers since I first asked about the future of Rondo Cottages. Now, there's less than a week to go before the Rondo Cottagers return to see what repairs are needed after the winter. Their leases are set to expire in less than eight months. If no decision is reached, your Liberal government minister will force them to tear down their cottages at their own expense after December 2017. These cottagers need to know answers now. Cottages are in need of repair. Minister, you've delayed this decision far too long. Question. So, Speaker, to the minister, will the minister commit today to extending the leases for the cottagers? Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite for the question. As he knows, the 20-year uh, lease was set to expire December 31, 2017, and that uh, our government's been taking steps to uh, allow existing private cottage lots in Rondo Provincial Park to continue until December 31, 2038. But a final decision will be informed by consultation, environmental and economic studies, and an, and, uh, an environmental assessment, and, and that's where it rests right now, with the Ministry of Environment, who is doing an environmental assessment. There are, uh, it's an approach that's intended to balance the interests of public cottagers and demonstrate fiscal responsibility while protecting the environment in Rondo Provincial Park. So we will continue to work with the cottagers. We Answer. understand time of is, is of the essence, but at the moment the file rests with the Minister for Environmental, uh, Environment and Climate Change. Supplementary. Um, speaker, wow. How many more environmental assessments have to be done? You know, years ago I was told that the ministry was waiting for the last environmental and economic study to be finished before they could make a decision. And I don't think that it's fair to compare Rondo to Algonquin. Rondo is a sound and solid community who are excellent stewards of the land. 
The studies are done, but still no answers, Minister. After many years, the deadline is fast approaching, and the government seems no closer to making up its mind. These cottages have been in families for decades. So, Speaker, with the lease deadline fast approaching, these cottagers need answers now. So, Speaker, to the minister, why are the Rondo cottagers still waiting Question? for an answer from this government? Precedence has been established for a 99-year lease. You might know that, too. Thank you. Sir. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. And this is a very complex topic. There's many different uh, stakeholders that uh, some are for keeping cottagers in the park, and yet there are other organizations and other stakeholders that are against keeping cottagers in the park. My ministry has been working alongside the Ministry of Environment and Climate Change to be able to see some of the conditions that will be required if the cottagers have an extension past December 31, 2017. We have uh, requested an independent third-party peer review of the environmental reports that have been prepared by the ministry to ensure the findings are accurate and balanced. The reports were revised to address comments received. And the conclusions of the report don't change. Yes, the environmental reports indicate that cottage lock structures and activities contribute to pressures on the park, a value such as rare and sensitive habitat, species at risk, and biodiversity. Member from Hamilton Mount. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Children and Youth Services. In February, fire swept through a foster home near Lindsay, killing 14-year-old Cassie Finbo and Andrea Reed, one of the caregivers. This tragic event highlights several serious concerns about foster and group homes. Four Aboriginal youth living in group homes in Ontario have died in the past six months. Kanina Sue Turtle, Courtney Scott, Amy Owen, Tammy Kiash, the Anishinaabe ASCII Nation has called for inquest as well as the Provincial Advocate for Children and Youth. The Ontario Association of Children's Aid Society has set a full understanding of prevention strategies that need to be implemented is required. Speaker, this is a crisis with our most vulnerable children. Will the minister institute mandatory inquests into the death of all children in care? Thank you. Seated, please. Thank you, Minister of Children and Youth Services. Well, thank you uh, very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and uh, thank you to the uh, the member uh, for asking this important question. Um, last week, I, um, I had the opportunity to go up to Timmins, and I met two of the families um, who have lost uh, children uh, in care. And um, you know, Mr. Speaker, um, any time a young person uh, here in the province. Uh, uh, we experience the death of a young person. It, uh, it saddens everyone here in this legislature. Um, but to answer specifically the question that the members asked, um, whenever a child dies in care, we want to make sure uh, that we take the appropriate steps necessary to prevent similar tragedies from ever happening again. And that's why, uh, Mr. Speaker, our ministry and the Office of the Chief Coroners have joint directives in place so that an investigation is conducted whenever a child does die in care. Uh, based on the finding of these investigations, the coroner provides Thank recommendations, sir. which then ensures that each Children's Aid Society uh, has to follow. So, Mr. Speaker, there are steps in place, and the uh, member knows opposite when, Thank you. when we actually— Time. Minister of Labour on a point of order. Speaker, on a point of order, I'd like to correct my record in an answer to the member from the Kitchener of Waterloo today. At the end, I said I couldn't agree more that the changing workplaces was a waste of time. Obviously, I meant I couldn't disagree more that the changing workplaces was a waste of time. <laughs> Chief Government Whip on a point of order. Point of order, Mr. Speaker. I would like to uh, introduce in the member's gallery, he was there at least, uh, the Mayor of St. Catharines, Mayor Walter Senzik. Who is here with impact today? Thank you. Thank, you. Thank you, Speaker. I just wish to acknowledge some students who are here earlier from Bowmanville High School. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, yes, thank you, Speaker. Um, I'd also like to welcome a representative from Impact, Caitlin Potts. There's no relationship. <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> 
Pursuant to Standing Order 38A, the member from Haldeman Norfolk has given notice of his dissatisfaction with the answer to his question given by the Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs concerning processing vegetable marketing. This matter will be debated today at 6 p.m. We have a deferred vote on the amended uh, amendment to the motion that is the House approves in general the budgetary policy of the government. Calling the members, this will be a five-minute bill.
All members, please take your seats. All members. On April 27, 2017, Mr. Souza moved, seconded by Ms. Wynn, that this House approves in general the budgetary policy of the government. On May 8, 2017, Mr. Fideli moved that the motion moved by the Minister of Finance on April 27, 2017, that this House approves in general the budgetary policy of the government be amended by deleting the words following that this House and adding thereto the following recognizes that Ontario has not balanced the budget and, in fact, contains a $5 billion operational deficit financed through one-time revenue sources and cash grabs. And $10 billion in new debt, and therefore the government has lost the confidence of the House. All those in favour of the amendment, please rise one at a time and be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Arnott. Mr. Arnott. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. McLeod. Mr. McLeod. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Jones. Mr. Jones. Mr. Brown. Mr. Brown. Mr. Clark. Mr. Clark. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Hillier. Mr. Hillier. Mr. Miller Perry Sound Muskoka. Mr. Miller Perry Sound Muskoka. Mr. McNaughton. Mr. McNaughton. Mr. Thompson. Mr. Thompson. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Yurick. Mr. Yurick. Mr. McLaren. Mr. McLaren. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Osterhoff. Mr. Osterhoff. Mr. Walker. Mr. Walker. Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith. Mr. Harris. Mr. Harris. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Marteau. Mr. Marteau. Mr. Pettipe. Mr. Pettipe. Mr. Coe. Mr. Coe. Mr. Cho. Mr. Cho. Mr. Vantoff. Mr. Vantoff. Ms. Horvath. Ms. Horvath. Mr. Tappan. Mr. Tappan. Mr. Mr. Miller, Hamilton East Stony Creek. Mr. Miller, Hamilton East Stony Creek. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Taylor. Mr. Natasha. Mr. Natasha. Mr. Angelina. Mr. Angelina. Ms. Fife. Ms. Fife. Mr. Manta. Mr. Manta. Uh, Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Gretzky. Mr. Gretzky. Mr. Gates. Mr. Gates. All those opposed, please rise one at a time be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Nackley. Mr. Nackley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Del Duca. Mr. Del Duca. Mr. Sandals. Mr. Sandals. Mr. Sousa. Mr. Sousa. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Matthews. Ms. Matthews. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Duguid. Mr. Duguid. Mr. Charles. Mr. Charles. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. Takar. Mr. Takar. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole. Mr. Bernardetti. Mr. Bernardetti. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Murray. Mr. Murray. Mr. Chan. Mr. Chan. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Coteau. Ms. Hunter. Ms. Hunter. Mr. Leal. Mr. Leal. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Tebow. Mr. Tebow. Madame Lalonde. Madame Lalonde. Mr. Cadre. Mr. Cadre. Mr. Dixon. Mr. Dixon. Mangas, Manga. Mr. Crack, Mr. Crack, Mr. Domerla, Mr. Domerla, Mr. McGarry, Mr. McGarry, Mr. Morrow, Mr. Morrow, Mr. Jassic, Mr. Jassic, Mr. Zimmer, Mr. Zimmer, Mr. Albanese, Mr. Albanese, Mr. McMahon, Mr. McMahon, Mr. Ballard, Mr. Ballard, Mr. Nidu Harris, Mr. Nidu Harris, Mr. Wong, Mr. Wong, Mr. Fraser, Mr. Fraser, Mr. Fraser, Mr. Anderson, Mr. Anderson, Mr. Baker, Mr. Baker, Mr. Dong, Mr. Dong, Mr. Hogarth, Mr. Hogarth, Mr. Koala, Mr. Koala, Mr. Koala, Mr. Molly, Mr. Molly, Mr. Martin, Mr. Martin, Mr. Milch, Mr. Milch, Mr. Potts, Mr. Potts, Mr. Rinaldi, 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 The ayes are 39, the nays are 53. The ayes being 39 and the nays being 53, I declare the amendment lost. Now, we now come to the motion of Mr. Souza, that is, the House approves in general the budgetary policy of the government. Is it the pleasure of the House uh, that Mr. Souza's motion carry? I heard a no. All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. All opposed, please say nay. My opinion, the eyes have it. Call in the members. This will be a five-minute bell. First.
The motion of Mr. Souza that this House approves in general the budgetary policy of the government. All those in favour, please rise one at a time be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Souza. 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 Mr.